in this uh, video we are going to do some manual modeling of a triangle group that uh, contains workers' compensation data. It's pretty old. Um, we're going to illustrate uh, constraints and uh, also we visit uh, model uh, templates. So I'm going to open the database. Uh, open database and then it's workbook 104A and I'm going to go to a triangle group called ABC this one here let's open that and it already has a lot of models and so on um, we do have an exposure vector this is real data so if you go to X inflation premiums uh, there's something called base and it's really reflective of uh, wage bills. It's, it's relative to wage bills. So um, you can see the exposure sort of decrease a bit in the middle exit in tiers and then they increase. Um, okay, what we're going to do first is create another data set. And to create another data set, you go to New. So we go to Data Sets tab, then New and create another data set which is the paid losses but it's going to be called PLI1 and with that one we won't assign any exposure um, so we're going to go to exposure down whatever arrow here and use none so how do we know that the base exposure that we're using exposure vector we're using is better than not using any exposure. So what we could do is uh, uh, highlight PLI1, go to PTF, go back to the triangle group with the right button of your mouse on the triangle group tab, in case you can't see it, select ABC with the left button of your mouse, highlight PLI and now click on PTF. Now tile vertically Minimize regression tables. <coughs> now, later on we're going to review the model templates, but there's a model in the model templates, one of the models, um, allows to see whether or compare two exposure vectors. Now, the exposure vector that does a better job is the one that more closely reflects changes along the accident years. So, with the right button of your mouse, so look at model templates with the right button of your mouse, select all, so that is both in this case, there's only two, and select the separation method. Double click on that, and then again select the separation method. So to both triangles, we've removed all the development year trends. We have a new trend parameter between every two periods. And we've removed all the calendar year trends. We have a new trend parameter amongst all the calendar years. And the reason we want to do that is to find out what happens, what is left over along the excellent years. Excellent years on the left, excellent years on the right. You don't really need to look at the model displays, so you can now tile vertically minimizing other types. I mean, the ones that were active were the, the model display, so we're going to minimize the um, model displays and only tile vertically. The, um, we're going to minimize the model displays, tile vertically, the residual graphs. Now, which one has few excellent here changes? I think that's the one on the right. And the one on the right is the one where we did use exposures. It was PLI. PLI1, that data set, didn't use any exposures. So we feel like all the exposures were equal to 1. So uh, we've now made a decision that we should go with those exposures because they're more reflective in terms of the excellent tier changes. They're more reflective, but they still don't explain all the excellent tier changes. Okay, so let's now close all regression tables. Close all regression tables. So we're back to the triangle group. So you go to the X with the downward arrow. Close all regression tables. Uh, to bring back the triangle group, you can either double click here or click once here. 
on these icons, triangle group view, or with the right button of your mouse, you can select ABC. Well, let's just click here. Now, PLI, so we're going to model PLI, that data set with that corresponding base exposure. So we're going to model the normalized data on the log scale. We go to PTF. The residuals in the model display are immediately open. You tile vertically and you minimize regression tables. And we're going to model this data manually, although you'll see later on the wizard does it in about a millisecond. So we go to the, the first direction we tend to model. Assuming accident years were homogeneous, we'd expect some kind of development pattern versus development years. So let's add a parameter between 1 and 2. Makes sense. 2 to 3, and say 6 to 7. And then go to E. And estimate. Now, this big observation here, if you look at the four residual graphs, it definitely does stand out. I mean, there's no need for you to actually look at the uh, diagnostic tools, but anyway, let's do it. Good practice. Diagnostic tools, magnifying glass for the three diamonds, and you can see it really stands out. Close that. Give it zero weight in any one of these graphs. Make it black. Estimate. Add another parameter between 5 and 6. Estimate. Now, the direction you tend to model now, whether, whether do you, should you tackle accident years first or calendar years, is the display from the right that has more changes. So it seems like the more changes in the early accident years than are in the early calendar years. So now, you remember, along the accident years, you click with the right button to introduce a whole new parameter. And you get an L sitting there just representing a large variance uh, that you would have studied in, uh, in uh, the previous set of videos, Chapter 5. So let's, with the right button, introduce a parameter from 77 to 78, and with the right button to 78 and 79. Um, now, we don't do anything towards the right, we always work from the left and see what happens to the right side. So we click on E to estimate, and at the moment that looks pretty straight, so we leave it. So now we go to calendar years, click on the residual versus accident years, go to the title versus calendar years, add a parameter between 83 and 84, 84 to 85, and 85 to 86. And estimate. Now add one between 1881 and estimate. I know you'll see because the accident years and calendar years are related, we've kind of screwed up the accident years. So we need to work on them. We haven't finished with them. They looked okay before we handled the calendar years, but once we made change along the calendar years, we needed more changes now along the accident years. So with the right button, 79 to 80, Obviously, remember, you're looking at levels now. There's a new level in 82, so 81 to 82, and a new level 82 to 83. And that, let's assume that's the same level. So estimate now. Oh, well, we need another one from 83 to 84. 84 and 85 are the same level, but a new level, 85 to 86. Don't do anything between the last two sets of, uh, of years, 86 and 87. Estimate, and that looks pretty straight. <coughs> now, if you look at development years now, it seems like you've got to add a parameter from 7 to 8. I guess in all directions, that looks pretty straight. No, well, well let's, let's be, uh, uh, let's be um, not cheap. Add 1 from 4 to 5. Okay, let's now save this model as before optimized. Save it before optimized. So let's just look at the model display. So I'm going to maximize that. Now if I click on O, you might remember the pink is removed. If you click on uh, the next O, the pink versus the calendar years will be removed. 
Uh, if you click on O oh, now, the pink along the accident tiers will be removed. Now there's another pink along the accident tiers, so just click on O oh, once. Then there's a pink along the development tiers will be removed. Then another pink along the calendar tiers will be removed. And stop here. And let's save that as before optimize 1. So before optimize 1. I'm assuming you know how to save a model. You just go to EOM, M with a downward arrow, and you click on that to save a model. Save. OK, what the system is going to do now in the next it optimizes is set up what we call constraints. It's going to argue if you point your cursor to X and T86 and you look at the last, uh, second last line, it says that alpha 87 and alpha 79, the difference between those two levels is insignificant. In other words, they have the same level. Now, to do this manually, you can click with your mouse on that line, 86 to 87, the parameter, the level, and you come up with parameter constraints dialog, excellent chair parameters. It tells you that 86 to 87, the selected line in this table is the first line. And it tells you that 86 and 87, the level from 86, the level 86 to 87 are the same, the level for 79, <coughs> the T-ratio difference is that. So um, basically, they are the same parameter. And in order to set them to be the same, you add to selection. In other words, to select a line. So if you double click on Add to Selection, can you see these have now, the difference has been set to be 0. If you estimate and close, you'll see a bridge in here that sets those two parameters to be the same. If you want to remove the constraint, you click on the bridge, and then you can double click on separate. Or, given there's only one constraint, you can say remove alpha constraints, or remove all of them. In this case, it's only one. And then close, estimate and close. Now, if you click on O now, it will do it itself. Then it's going to set up another constraint. OK. And I think O oh, again, it didn't set up constraints. So I want to run the previous model. So you go to the logbook. And my run is 21. I want to run the previous model again. I just double click on that row in the um, in the logbook. So let's double click. So that's the previous model. And let's save that as before optimize to say. What it's going to do now is the varying parameter. In other words, it's going to it's like sort of exponential smoothing. Um, two ways that has been described in videos. Uh, chapter 5, so it's going to reduce those variances. Um, well, let's click on O now. Again, again, again. Well, it's finished, so we can save this model as good. Oops. Oops. Good. OK. Now, let's suppose you load the model before Optimize. So we go to lo Load Model, M with the upward arrow here, second from the left under the PTF, and uh, Load Before Optimize. If you just click on Double O, it'll get you the same position. <coughs> Now, you might want to test, if you look at the residuals versus calendar years, that there's a new trend between 80 and 80, between 80 and 81, all the way to 83, and then it goes down. So you add a parameter between 80 and 81, 
ADC to 84, estimate, then click on double O, and there's nothing there. Okay, now, let's revisit the um, model templates. If you go to model templates, there are these models here. The default model when you enter the P, uh, PTF module is one parameter in each direction, which we call a single gamma with inflation. Let's estimate the single gamma model. Well, that just has one development year trend, one alpha parameter, and inflation has been set to zero. Okay? You could regard it as a kind of starting model, but as soon as you see that, it sort of tells you, hey, how about if we also have a calendar year trend? So, um, not to waste so much time, although I guess we don't waste so much time anyway because everything is pretty fast with the system. The starting model in PTF is the next one, which is single gamma model with inflation, which if I cancel this, we could do this manually by just adding a parameter between 77 and 78 on the residual graph, and you estimate. So that's really the starting model, and then you use that to build a model. Okay, what about the next one, model templates? It's the Cape Cod. What does that do? It just removes all development year trends to see what's left over in the other two directions. So you can see that the residuals versus development years, that one is zero. These two average to zero. They will always average to zero if you add up the residuals in any column because you've measured the average trend between every two development years. It's a diagnostic tool. It actually tells you that after I've removed development year trends, is there anything happening along the accident years? And the answer is in the affirmative. But if there's something going on along the accident years, there must be something going along the calendar years and vice versa because they interact with each other. The next one is Cape Cod with inflation. <coughs> you know, one calendar year trend. And you can see that you need more than one calendar year trend, which we actually have in our model. Diagnostic tool. The next one is an interesting diagnostic tool. Some people use it to forecast. We never do. It's really a bit like a circus. It's got too many parameters. Okay, it doesn't really tell you what trend, uh, what's the implicit trend or the explicit trend you're using in forecasting the future. We call it the statistical chain ladder. It makes very similar assumptions to the MAC method in terms of having a parameter for every accident year and a parameter for every development year. That model removes all the development year trends and all the calendar accident year trends. Why is it useful? <clears throat> well, let's think. We know that any calendar year trend projects in the other two directions. So this model, statistical uh, diagnostic tool, answers the following question. If I remove all the development year trends in my data and all the accident year trends in my data, is there anything left over along the calendar years? And if there is, it must be coming from the calendar years. And the answer is in the affirmative. There's a lot coming from the calendar years. <coughs> Very powerful diagnostic tool. Let's look at another one. Separation method. It removes all the development year trends and all the calendar year trends to see what's left over along the um, Excellent years, and there's a lot left over, which actually happens to be in our model. What another, another diagnostic tool? I call it APY. Well, actually, that, that model is very similar to the SGI, single gamma model, you know, the starting model in PTF. Let's look at that one. It removes all the calendar year trends and accident year trends to see what's left over in the development years. But you have a similar picture when you actually uh, run the SGI model. What about the next one? which you can't do in Excel or any other statistical package because you'd have to invert a matrix that's not invertible. It's a singular matrix. You've got too many parameters. In fact, if you look at the standard errors of the parameters, they're essentially infinite. That's removing the trends in all directions. If you do that, well, all the residuals have got to look good, right? All of them have to look good. Incidentally, if we go back model templates and we choose the chain ladder, 
because it's got an alpha parameter for every accident here, it doesn't matter what exposures you use. The exposures will go into that parameter, the residual. If I change the exposures, uh, if I go to, let's do it, go back to the triangle group ABC, so with the right button of your mouse on the triangle group tab, select ABC, go to PLI, highlight PLI1 now, right? That doesn't have any exposures. Click on PTF, go to model templates, and select the statistical chain letter. Now tile vertically, minimize other uh, regression minimize regression tables, and click on one of the residual graphs. And now tile vertically, minimize other types. The residual graphs are identical because when you divide by an exposure to normalize the data, and you take a logarithm, it's just that you take the uh, so it's the log of the data minus the log of the logarithm. So the log of the logarithm just goes into the alpha parameters. So the alpha parameters in one, uh, the one that uses the exposures, um, the difference in alpha parameters will be the differences in the log of the exposure. <coughs> the same as the log of the exposure. Okay. Thank you.